All right, folks, good afternoon. We're going to get started here. I want to thank everybody for taking some time to join our webinar this afternoon. Uh, greetings from a rain-soaked and hurricane-prone Florida. Uh, my name is Jeff Yeagley uh, with Compass IT Compliance, and I'll be today's moderator for the webinar. Uh, just to go over a couple quick housekeeping rules before we get started here officially, uh, everybody's line has been muted at this point in time to eliminate any background noise or distractions that might occur. Uh, if you have any questions, we will have some time at the end. This webinar is scheduled for about 25 minutes for Jerry to go through his presentation and then about a five minute Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions on the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat logo. Feel free to click on that and then you can send your questions in either to everybody, uh, so the entire group can see the questions and then Jerry can answer those in the order in which they came in. Uh, or you can send them to me directly. Again, my name is Jeff. Uh, again, Jeff with a G. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for joining. Today's webinar is going to be on the top five things that you can do to mitigate your risk in your environment. Our presenter is Jerry Hughes. Jerry is our senior executive IT auditor and one of our managing partners. So uh, very excited to have him presenting this topic. Uh, he has extensive experience in all facets of really uh, IT and IT security. Uh, and Jerry, you've been uh, running Compass uh, now for, what, about 13 years now, right? So uh, he's, he's seen it all and done it all. So without further ado, I'm going to quiet down, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hughes. Jerry, take it away, man. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And, folks, thanks again. I just want to echo a couple of comments that uh, Jeff made. I appreciate you making taking the time uh, for the webinar. It'll be 25 minutes or so, and uh, I do welcome questions. So just kind of moving through, uh, we've got an agenda here to – we want to try to achieve here. Let me get my page down here, my PowerPoint to, to cooperate. There we go. This is today's agenda. We're going to cover the IT security challenges that folks I'll just kind of briefly mentioned on a couple of the, the, the real life uh, uh, challenges that folks are seeing in their businesses today. Uh, I'll cover an overview of five tips to mitigate uh, risks within your organization. And, um, and then I'll go down and drill down each one of those so you'll have a, a, some uh, direction and tips, if you will, to help take uh, those risks from higher uh, elevated uh, levels to uh, to a lower level of reasonable risk. Uh, we'll look at some long-term IT security steps that you can take and implement uh, right out of the gate. Really, a lot of this doesn't take um, a lot of uh, a lot of effort to get to get in place. Some of it will be uh, definitely uh, you know uh, items might be uh, required that budgeting takes place. A lot of the elements you can do um, really quickly and inexpensively, and I hope that you'll take advantage of, of some of those. And then uh, at the end of the um, uh, presentation, Jeff will make this presentation available on our website, and we've got some of the resources listed uh, that, that went into making and creating this presentation. So, you know, why, uh, you know, basically, why should we care about, uh, you know, a lot of stuff with respect to the IT, you know, risks out there today? And I guess this is really if you have lived in the cave for the last 10 years or so. Um, I mean, if you look at the paper every day and, and, and um, the statistics are alarming. And, and I live this business. I've been in IT for 30 years of my life and, and, and IT audit and security last year or so. And it's it's alarming. Over 169 million personal records were exposed in 2017, stemming from 781 publicized breaches across the financial business education, government, and health sectors. This isn't to suggest that's the total. These are the ones that were reported. So uh, many compromises go unreported. And I, I don't want to a good reason, but I certainly understand the business reasons why I wouldn't want to you know, publish exploits unless you're legally obligated to do so. The, um, you know, in, in, in some industries, you have no choice. Um, and the consumer certainly has a right to know if their information was compromised. So it's... Um, it's a, it's a difficult, challenging um, uh, issue. Um, the other thing is averaging, you know, you look at the average global cost uh, for each lost or stolen record, uh, you know, containing confidential or sensitive data. It's about $154 per record, which doesn't sound like much, but when you extrapolate that across the number of records that are typically compromised, you're going to look at some of these and see that they are, you know, far, uh, you know, they are, you know, bigger and, um, you know, the, the aggregate cost is, is huge. Uh, and this one's a surprise to me. The industry with the highest cost for stolen record is healthcare. And, and uh, it's about $363 per record. Uh, I had a client that uh, most recently had uh, some issues um, to, 
uh, you know, it was with respect to healthcare compromises. And here's how it was, it was uh, orchestrated. This client of ours uh, actually, you know, the, the records were uh, billing information for healthcare. And somehow they got their hands on this information and were able to um, exploit it. And, and, and at first glance, you might say, hey, you know, how, how's that even an, an, an issue, right? You got a list of people that owe a big deal. And what these folks did was they actually called on the consumer, uh, in this case, the patients or whatever, and that had healthcare services performed. And they were, they were calling as almost a collection agency or in some cases as the uh, health co- healthcare organization themselves saying, hey, Mr. Hughes, we saw you had an MRI in your knee, you know, three months ago, you, you know, you still have a, a balance in arrears of X amount, uh, you know, do you care to make a payment today? And it was extremely effective and, and, and uh, you know, just kind of shows you how easy and how creative these folks are. So, so don't discount anything as being a potential uh, opportunity uh, for fraud uh, because it's everywhere and, and the exploits are becoming so, so more, so much more f- uh, sophisticated uh, as time moves forward. Um, the median number of days that attackers stay different uh, within a network protection uh, is about uh, 200 or so days, which is also another kind of mind-blowing thing. It's not like they break uh, into your, your network and begin uh, to exploit uh, that situation. What they are doing is, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm seeing a note here, by the way, folks are searching and getting every other word. So what I'm going to do is uh, I think I'm going to jump onto a separate audio line. Uh, just bear with me for, for exact, you know, one moment here. I apologize uh, for that. Let me just go back a section and um, minimize this so I can get, yeah, because um, folks are uh, having an issue. Hang on just a second, Jeff. If, if you want to fill the, uh, the dead air, you go ahead and do that, but give me a time out here. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, sorry, folks. A couple, couple of technical difficulties, but we'll get that taken care of so that way you guys are able to hear Jerry and, and we can go through this. Um, and, uh, and, and get obviously this information is an important topic that we want to make sure that you folks uh, are able to uh, obviously hear. Uh, and then if you need to go back and, and uh, review it later on our website, uh, hear that as well. So uh, give us just a moment here. Thanks for the feedback. Again, apologize for the uh, uh, slight delay here in terms of the audio issues, but we'll get that taken care of. I think Jerry's just going to dial in right now, so we should be yeah. up and running uh, in a moment here. So. Uh, thanks again for your patience. Again, apologize for the uh, for the difficulties here. We'll be back on track in a moment. Hello, can you hear me on that one yet? Much better. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now I just. Need to be- yeah, that's me joining. Yeah, just one more, one more second, folks. And I want to mute. Okay, Jeff, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sounds good. Okay, and uh, let me get this back up, and away we go. Okay, can everybody see the screen okay now? Jeff? Yep, it's up and running. Looks good. Thank you. Okay, I apologize, folks. Let me get back to the slide I was on, and then we'll make believe that never happened. Okay, so uh, here we are. The uh, first item, uh, the top five, really was to in, uh, inventory authorized and unauthorized devices. Secondly, uh, we're looking to inventory authorized and unauthorized software. And then third, we're looking to create secure configurations for the hardware and software in our environments. Uh, the fourth item of the top five is to implement continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation. And the last is to restrict the use of administrative privileges. Okay, so these are just the top, you know, five um, that uh, that we've selected to kind of uh, target 
Um, the, the first item, the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices, this is really a requirement in many of the uh, industries that we do work in, whether it's governed by uh, PCI, folks that deal with payment card uh, information, it's a requirement that you uh, document and identify uh, those pieces of hardware that are in your cardholder data environment, or whether it's in the, uh, the banking industry, in the uh, production environment where critical systems exist, and, and the confidential information that you maintain for your customers or members, uh, where, where that flows and stored. So, so it's really, really important to get your arms around where um, the, the items, the hardware uh, resides and move to document it. There are tools listed there that you can do to actively or passively identify uh, those those systems that exist. And essentially these tools go out and search on IP devices and log them so you can see what uh, devices exist and it kind of does an inventory of them. So that's a that's a, a clean way, as well as with the DHCP server, you know, correlating information from the DHCP server to improve your asset inventory. It will help you to identify and detect uh, some systems that are in there that were unknown. So these are just a couple of ways of, of taking care of that. Uh, the other thing is maintaining the inventory of, of, the, of the systems on the network and the network devices themselves. So every system has an IP address and, and logging those IP addresses uh, by machine name, the purpose of it, the owner. These are, are requirements, again, uh, regulatory uh, requirements in many industries. And also their, their requirements, uh, certainly for best practices as well. Um, uh, you know, implementing uh, 802.1, uh, uh, you know, there are free tools as well that will help you uh, to, you know, to utilize this. And then uh, the use of client certificates to validate and authenticate systems prior to the system. So if you implement 802.1, for example, you'll already uh, do uh, this um, by using the certificate. So it's kind of a, a no-brainer there. The last item uh, relative to the inventory of authorized and unauthorized software, this, this is number two. And it's much like the hardware, uh, you know, the, the logging or... Uh, the inventory, again, it's a requirement in most industries, but it, it's paramount. If you try to look at, you know, how you're going to get your arms around, whether it's the hardware or the software in your environment, you got to know where, first of all, it resides. You got to know the business reason for it and, and, and who, the, who the data owner is and things like that. So going through system by system, this, this whole process really it, it, holistically is, is called data governance. You know, it starts with knowing what you have in your environments. Uh, it's, it's a big process. Again, not necessarily a costly one, uh, other than it takes time to, to inventory using tools and, and interviews and, and getting with each group. Again, it's very, very important. Some of the tools here are, um, that you'll see on this slide, are, are pretty, pretty slick. For example, you know, the deploying of application whitelisting. This will allow you to basically run only the software listed uh, on the whitelist. And, and it extends, extends to, you know, even uh, systems that are uh, remotely hosted. Uh, this will allow you as a business owner or, or security person uh, within uh, your IT group to be able to govern, you know, what, what your, your, your employees are able to get in terms of, of websites and, and what applications are able to be run on your systems, which definitely mitigates a lot of the bigger risks out there, such as what, ransomware, uh, and things like that, where you, you control where folks go versus, uh, you know, sort of wild, wild west, right, where they go out and kind of connect it and download and, and, and run software from anywhere. You really need to get your arms around that. There's a few more examples listed below, just tools that you can uh, utilize to help this. Uh, last um, slide on, on the inventory of the uh, software. You know, um, you really need to track, much like we talked about with the hardware. In this case, we're going to track the OS version of uh, applications installed, for example, Microsoft, uh, SAM, and uh, it should be tied to the uh, asset uh, inventory as well. And um, also uh, examples uh, include Microsoft S, uh, CCM and SAM. You tie together the hardware and the software asset, which is, which is huge. So anyway, uh, going forward with um, this uh, idea of the inventory, you know, we need to um, let me see, I'm trying to advance my slide. Here we go. Third, third item, uh, you know, is moving toward the configuration. So now we've established uh, sort of logging and inventorying of hardware and the software. And now we're taking it to a little bit deeper level, looking at the configurations of both, right? So I can have hardware in my environment and you could have it at your business and, and one of us could install it in a secure, compliant manner while the other could just uh, have, um, you know, back doors open on accident and, and default passwords everywhere. 
that have been removed, things like that. So, so this is certainly a secure and a non-secure way of, of implementing both hardware and software. This, this configuration requirement for secure configuration standards is also, uh, it's required by PCI, it's required by the financial industry, and, and, and the healthcare industry as well. So really anywhere uh, consumers are being served in your businesses, uh, regardless of what the vertical is, uh, it's a requirement that we tech the consumer confidential information. And the way to really do that is to ensure that the systems that we run are secure and locked down and implemented in, 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 a, in a secure, tight way. A, a configuration standard is going to allow you to also enjoy the repeatability of systems uh, as they're being implemented. For example, you may have a great IT staff at your business, and, but if there's turnover in staff, uh, how can we ensure that the next uh, person or people taking those roles are installing those systems in a very secure, sound manner, the way it was done previously? And the answer to that is with strong policies requiring system uh, configuration standards for each piece of hardware in your environment and, and software. And that's really what the gist of this is. Um, the last slide on this one is really storing you know, master images. So it goes along with the configuration standard itself. But having these master images, so again, I, if I'm the new guy on the block, I can come in and implement these systems from these master images to ensure the consistency and the rollout of new hardware as it's being staged and to make sure that we're doing it the way you know, management is, has dictated in the policies uh, that govern our business. And I'm just carrying it out. Uh, all remote administration over secure channels. If you look at this, this is a big item too, you know, governing uh, remote access, especially, especially administrative access. We're looking at ensure, uh, ensuring that we've got uh, strong encryption activity. Uh, uh, that is to say, TLS 1.0, which has been compromised, uh, you know, disabling the use of that, uh, ensuring that we're using only secured, approved uh, uh, methods uh, to connect. Um, and then you look at some of these um, you know, weaker methods of like telnetting and, and such um, that need to be disabled and, and uh, documented uh, if they need for business reasons. Um, so, so anyway, going forward to the last slide on configurations uh, for the hardware and software in your environment, using um, file integrity monitoring software, FIM. FIM's util utilized in, and, and required to be utilized in the, again, the PCI world as well as in the uh, financial world as well, when you look at the FFIEC governance uh, and the direction that comes from the banking world, uh, the way it's utilized essentially is this. You know, you're not, you're not going to monitor uh, dynamic files that are changing, but rather you're going to look at the static files that are responsible for uh, the security of a system. Uh, you're going to monitor even executable files uh, that, you know, so that um, uh, they can't be you know, recompiled and replaced with rogue uh, code that has been um, uh, altered to, to perform uh, negative activity. So, so this is a way of ensuring that only productions approved uh, executables are running in your environment. Um, these are, these uh, solutions and the use of FIM have stemmed from uh, uh, case studies and examples where uh, just those examples I gave, those have actually been carried out with success where folks have gone in and recompiled code and, and the file name is exactly the same, you know, abc.exe, and, and it does what it's intended to do, but in addition, it's doing some negative uh, things as well. So that's a way of, of kind of making sure you've got your arms around it. Uh, so implementing and testing automated configuration monitoring systems, those are great, you know, look, if you've got a very mature uh, IT environment, there's no way you and your staff are gonna be able to monitor everything uh, actively. So, so using automated tools is a great way to uh, to detect and, and to identify uh, issues within your environment and, and, and to look and, and, and test your configurations to ensure that they've been properly implemented to reduce the risk. Uh, the fourth item uh, is really to implement continuous vulnerability assessments and remediation. So um, you know, really the recommendation um, is, to, is to run automated vulnerability scans you know, weekly, I think, would be uh, advantageous. Most of these software licenses, uh, we use Qualys, and, and we're, we can run unlimited. We can run them daily on our environment. We can run them weekly, monthly. And I think at a minimum, it would be advantageous for you to, to run them, um, you know, uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, what they're going to identify for you are control weaknesses. Um, and, and by the way, um, this is both internal and external vulnerability assessments. And if you ask me which obviously is more secure, which is more critical, I'm going to say, obviously, the perimeters, right? So your external vulnerability assessments are, are paramount, right? That is to say, protect your 
perimeter first, work your way in uh, to ensure that your uh, internal network uh, is also uh, buttoned down. But um, anyway, with that said, you're looking to, with these scans, to identify control weaknesses, whether it's an old piece of software that has known exploits or that we haven't patched a system or an operating system uh, where it should have been patched. This will identify those kinds of, of things, as well as poor coding techniques. I'm blown away every year when I look at the Verizon list that comes out for threats and vulnerabilities that have been exploited. Uh, and it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to, to me to still see cross-site scripting, SQL injection among the top uh, you know, five or ten items uh, that have uh, consistently been uh, exploited. These attacks have been around forever. The defense is very simple, and yet we still see them. So really um, going through and, and assessing with a vulnerability scan is going to identify those for you, and then you can move to mitigate those uh, risks and reduce the overall risk at your organization. Just a little bit more on that. Performing these scans uh, in an authenticated mode, either with agents running locally on each system or remotely with scanners. You know, we do it with, um, you know, for internal, we'll put an appliance on, on a client's uh, network and, and, and run the scans automated. Um, likewise, we've, we've done from the external perspective, we, we can run it from anywhere in the world and, and, and assess um, the uh, perimeter of a client's environment. Um, I'll take this a little bit for to while we talk here about vulnerability assessing, you know, penetration testing, uh, I really wanted to include in this as well, and that's really taking those, those vulnerabilities that were identified, moving to exploit those, and that's where the rubber really hits the road. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's identifying methods that, that are successful today in, in taking some of these vulnerabilities uh, and exploiting them, and, and so by knowing those are weaknesses in your environment, you know, getting the results of pen tests are really, really important. Moving to mitigate those immediately, prioritizing the higher risks, and, and again, this is another case where it's it's not only a best practice and for me a common sense thing, but it's also a requirement in the, in the banking industry, uh, healthcare, uh, PCI, uh, you name it. So at least running a, a an annual or semi annual penetration test, both externally on the perimeter and internally. And the reason why the internal piece is so important is, you know, a big way to mitigate and minimize the cost of compliance and, and security is to is to segment your environment. Segment your environment. That is to say, you know, moving critical and confidential systems into, you know, one or more segments where that processing takes place, and really protecting that and scanning and and monitoring that those segments is huge. But the key to all of that is ensuring that we've properly segmented. If we're banking on the fact that we have segmented, you know, the critical confidential elements that we serve our customers with, and, and yet our segmentation fails. And we've done nothing. So, so penetration testing, both internal uh, on the internal side, uh, inside of the segment, and outside of that segment on the internal side, is going to help demonstrate that your segmentation is strong and and, and was done properly. So, so that's huge. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, going forward, uh, and the implementation of continuous vulnerability assessing and remediation logs for monitoring, we we, we require in the PCI world that you centralize uh, log files. That is to say turning on all logging and audit trails for each system uh, and application and centralizing those uh, to a log server and interrogating it uh, with software automatically so that you are alerted um, when, when certain conditions are, are met. And this is the way, again, if you think of a very large mature IT environment, it's nearly impossible to think that we could look at each, uh, each log file every day to ensure that we're not being uh, attacked in certain areas but with, with the appropriate centralized log serving tools and monitoring software, we can do this uh, for very vast and large networks and environments. So turn on your logging, centralize it, and have it interrogated automatically and alert on it. And then finally, tying back that file integrity monitoring software we talked about earlier, this is another place where it belongs so that logs can't be uh, altered uh, on systems. The, these logs often lead to root cause issues and, and really the only way to, to fix an issue is to know how it was first uh, caused so that you can, uh, that you indeed have remediated uh, the risk. So, so this is a big, big item uh, as well. The last item of the five that we talked about uh, that we identified earlier was really restricting, restricting the use of administrative privileges. So, so on all critical uh, systems and devices, it starts with really looking at systems uh, you know, even the hardening of, of, of workstations and laptops within your environment so that your employees 
you know, you know, whether it's intentional or unintentional, can't be running software that could harm not only their system, uh, but, but and be uh, infectious to the rest of it, your network when they attach to the network. So, so locking it down from that level and working your way up, really, it's, um, uh, it's paramount that your network devices are all locked down and, and uh, uh, that uh, only administrators uh, with, the, with the necessary business need to have access have it, that we have dual control and, and a way to sort of ensure checks and balances are in place so that no one employee holds the keys to the kingdom and that should uh, an internal exploit take place, uh, it really, uh, would require uh, you know, more than one person to go go rogue, and, and statistically, that's uh, more of an anomaly than reality. So, so that really ties things down. And then working your way out to the most critical piece, the perimeter, looking at your firewalls and, and routers and such to ensure that we've locked down our perimeter, that we have only administrators that have the appropriate access to have business reasons, have that, and then you know, employ um, you know, strong uh, password uh, resetting policies as well on these devices to ensure that we're resetting and uh, uh, our, our passwords uh, for these administrative accounts. That's, that's huge. Um, and then um, really bring this home, looking at the configuring of systems to ensure that log entries and alerts um, when an account is added or removed. So when I talk about the central log server, you know, if I'm an administrator on a firewall and I've done, made some changes, that, that add or change should raise an alert uh, to, to the folks that are on that list. So that's a way of, again, checks and balances being in place to ensure that no one person has the keys to the kingdom. And this is a, a case where it's a, really a detective control. If I was to uh, make an ex, uh, change that was to create a backdoor or a firewall or somewhere, it should be picked up on a log file and, and alert uh, the other folks that are on that uh, alerting list. So it's a great, great control in the environment. Um, configuring systems to issue a log entry on any unsuccessful login uh, log in to an administrative account, and also then the use of multi-factor authentication for all administrative access, uh, including domain administrative access. These are, you know, today uh, best practices. They are also and have advanced in uh, the uh, industry that we do a lot of our work in, which is the financial sector, uh, the PCI world, uh, the healthcare industry, and higher education. These are all uh, requirements now that, that folks uh, have taken these measures to require multi-factor authentication for critical systems and for remote administrative access. Last slide uh, on the restricting of the use of administrative privileges, where a, a multi-factor uh, is not supported, use long passwords, um, you know, passphrases, things of that nature. Uh, administrators are required to access systems with a fully logged standard account, you know, Windows run as or Linux as sudo, so we can we can track uh, you know, who did what, when, and where. That's the key to audit work, by the way. It's, it's really determining, you know, uh, who, who made the changes, what, uh, what they changed, and, and what was affected by the changes, and, and these methods that will help us uh, to be able to track uh, who, who made uh, critical changes. Uh, admins should use de uh, dedicated machines uh, for all their administrative tasks. Uh, machines should be isolated from organizational primary uh, network. So the organization's primary network and also be uh, not allowed to be on the internet. For obvious reasons, right? If I'm using a system that's connected to the network, uh, our organization's network, or if I'm going out on the internet and uh, you know going to sites and things with this this critical system, and if it's exploited, uh, the exploits can can be propagated to these other critical systems that I'm uh, connecting to as an administrator. So, uh, so isolation uh, from your network and from the internet is is very very important. Uh, machines should also not be used for for email. Uh, for document editing, and, and again, I mentioned earlier, surfing the web. Uh, next steps, you look at these remaining 15 cybersecurity controls. Uh, there's 20 total, and those are the top five I kind of gave you. Um, the, you know, the rest of these items, you can see them on this list, and they'll, they'll be made available uh, on, on our website with this presentation. It looks like I'm winding down on time. I wanted to see, Jeff, if there are any questions that any folks had. Gary, great job, man. Thanks for uh, giving this information. We do have a couple questions that came in privately here, so uh, let me kind of go through those with you here quickly. Uh, the first one is, I understand the approach of inventorying hardware and software, uh, but how do I control or stop new hardware and software from being introduced? It's a good question. Yeah, very, very good question. And this is the crux of actually what I mentioned earlier, which is uh, IT governance or data governance. 
know, you make a good point, whoever that question was from. It really, you've got, uh, you've got a right that is, there's, there's two things going on here. One is sort of stop the bleeding, right? Identify, you identify where we are today, you know, and, and put controls around that by, by documenting and identifying those critical uh, hardware, app, you know, hardware systems and then the applications. But then going backwards, right, and saying, well, you know, how do we stop new stuff from coming in while I'm inventorying and while I'm controlling it? And, and the way we did it with some organizations that we did data events with uh, and for, it was really to get to uh, look at policies uh, for the acquisition or, uh, of um, procurement. So, so most organizations have a procurement uh, policy. A lot of them will, will fold it into their SDLC, system development lifecycle, and that is, you know, usually it starts with buyer to build it. And in either case, it's a case where, you know, a decision's made. So, so getting with your CFO and identifying who controls the purse strings, because nothing comes in there. You know, these folks in your companies aren't going to buy it with their own money. They're going to buy it with company money. And that comes with the CFO. It goes through the CFO's desk. So, so find the uh, find find and understand the process at your at your business and put controls in place to to govern the the purchase uh, power of of individuals in your organization and that at least that way you you can govern what comes in and out and you at least have uh, a way to inventory as it goes forward. Any other questions, Jeff? Yeah, we got one other one here, Jerry, and I know that we're running a few minutes over. So um, let's see. How can I be sure that the configurations I have set are secure. Yeah, and that's again that's key, right? It's almost like when I mentioned, you know, one of the configurations I'll refer to here is, is your segmentation really is ensuring that whether I'm segmenting with my firewall or layer three switches or uh, you know whatever way you're you're segmenting, you know, you're banking a lot on that, right? You're really banking on the fact that by, by sweeping all my critical systems and applications into you know one or or, or several uh, uh, seg segments that are you know uh, confidential, uh, I, need, I need to make sure that at least the segmentation is done properly because it all falls apart if that's not even done right. And the answer then for this is the same. It is testing it, right? So make sure that uh, in this case, you run a vulnerability and a penetration test on your segments to, to ensure that um, it's properly segmented, that all risks on the systems, internal and external to that, uh, have been mitigated to reasonable levels. And the case for a configuration standard for a particular device, I'll even take it a little bit further, uh, and ask that you you know you go to uh, you know if it's a you know a firewall or a sonic wall or whatever go to the manufacturer's site download and stay on one of those uh, use lists or, or uh, email lists that the vendors often have where you you stay up to speed on threats to to the hardware that you purchase and and stay up on firmware upgrades to the systems make sure that you've used all the vendor recommended. Uh, controls and security measures that they've provided and then furthermore once it's implemented in your environment go ahead and test it by again performing those vulnerability assessments and ensuring that indeed uh, they're functioning uh, properly excellent great stuff i think that's all the questions that we have folks so uh actually hold on one second here looks like we we have one more here uh we do have one more that just came in actually so what are the benefits of outsourcing firewall management versus internal management? So, yeah, yeah there, are, there are a number of benefits. Um, it, just like outsourcing, whether in this case they're talking about firewall management, but outsourcing any critical uh, facet of your business, the, the, one of the immediate advantages is the fact that you not need to maintain uh, on staff the, uh, the talent, right? The talent to manage it. And, and not just the primary talent, but I, I need a backup, right? I can't just have one person with the keys to the kingdom, like I mentioned before. What if they get run over by a bus? You know, you're handcuffed. So, so outsourcing has a lot of value to it. There's a cost to it for sure, but um, I highly recommend it. You know, but uh, the caveat is to ensure uh, that you follow your your vendor management uh, policy at your organization. And if you don't have one, get one and implement it because it's a way to ensure that the controls that this third party provider have in place are as sound and secure. As, as those uh, within your organization. Because really, just because you've outsourced it, the liability is still yours. You have the relationship with your consumers and your customers. And if they're exploited, they're looking at you. You made the decision to out outsource it, not them. So, so you need to make sure any relationships that you uh, enter into with a third-party provider that handles the confidential information of your customers that are compliant to whatever regulatory uh, industry that you're in and governed by, and get evidence of that on an annual proactive way. That is to say, they should be proactively sending you 
If they're PCI, they should be sending you their attestation of compliance on an annual basis. Uh, if they're a big service provider, they should you should be soliciting uh, a SOC 2 type, which is a service organization audit that identifies the systems in play and the controls that govern it. There's, there's a lot of ones. Those are two of the bigger ones, but there's a number of other ones ensuring that their background checks are performed on their employees and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, also you should maintain the right to audit. Availability also is huge if, if it's a critical uh, cog in the wheel of your business, you know, I make sure that they're up when I'm up and, and my customers expect that they're up. So what's my service level agreement say to my customers? If I promise them 24 hours and my third party provider says 72 hours, we got a big issue. So, so there's, there's those items. Um, and I know we're out of time, so I'll, st I'll stop there, Jeff. Thanks again, folks, for joining us today. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I hope that we're able to kind of bring it home with some of these uh, key items and Jeff's going to make this available. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. And again, as uh, echo Jerry's sentiments, thank you guys for joining and taking some time out of your day. So this was week one of our webinar series for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is obviously all of October. Uh, so join us next week. We're going to be doing another webinar, uh, webinar number two for Cybersecurity Awareness Month on the topic of ransomware, uh, which is obviously one of the topics that has everybody's attention. So again, thank you to everybody. For those of you that are located in the southeast, stay safe during this hurricane. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week for our ransomware presentation. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.